Hey guys, welcome to your study of the progressive movement. Uh, progressive movement today and in, in, uh, conservative talk show, uh, radio shows or broadcasts has a negative connotation uh, matching up the, the term progressive with socialism and in some aspects it was, especially in government. But there are some positives that did come out of this movement, which we will learn as we go through uh, this lesson together. Go ahead and pause the video. If you'd like to at any time, especially with uh, with all these objectives here, if you want to get those copied down. But let's go ahead and uh, move forward. Uh, this is a reform movement. It does touch every aspect of society. Uh, the four main parts are moral, social, economic, and political. Um, we will talk about each one of those specifically, the main movement in each, each area specifically. Um, it did shape and change the way we look at things today, and we can still see the effects of this movement uh, today. And a lot of people st still want to be considered even more progressive and move uh, forward even more. It does become uh, a period in history where government moves out of the laissez-faire stage and into uh, a regulatory stage. Uh, to some, that was too much. To others, it's n still not enough. Yeah, and then today. Uh, God, there's still some that believe that government is is not involved, not doing enough. Um, and, and examples of that are our current leadership, who's passing all kinds of laws and regulating uh, everything, including health care and gun control. So back to the late 1800s, just who was the progressive? What type of person could this be? Well, the good thing about this movement, the positive thing, the reason it was so successful, I guess, is if you could, could describe it that way, is because it, it accepted anybody who thought change was needed. It didn't have to be, you weren't required to be a certain status in society, a certain wealth or certain income to, to be a progressive. They are united by the similar goals in that let's change societies and the, the, you know meet the needs of society, but they did not necessarily agree which of the four was the best reform movement? You know, the people who focused on moral reform obviously thought that that was most important. People who focused on uh, the political reform thought that was most important. So even within the Progressive Party, you did not have to be unified and say, okay, let's tackle this issue because it has top priority. All four had top priority uh, in regards to how they were handled. So, yes, they have similar goals, similar attitudes, but uh, they did not have to agree on which one had the highest priority. Most of these people who are progressives we see as middle class. Uh, during the industrial age, there is no middle class. In fact, we see a separation of classes between lower and in lower income and, and, and the wealthy. But as, uh, as the years and industrial years move on, uh, we do see a, a middle class emerging made up of people in the clerical, the middle business standards, basically. People who live in the suburbs. The goal of the progressive was to find new rules for this new game and this new game has been generated because of industry and because of our involvement in in world affairs there's a new game now and now we have to figure out the new rules for this game and so we want to make the world better and more efficient and more moral uh, if we are truly to be the home of the free then we need to make it you know the home of the free we need to make it a place that people still want to come to these reforms are meant to last these people have a the progressives have a feeling of changing history they they knew that they could impact a change and uh, it wasn't like well let's just hope this works and hope this sticks they just they knew that this was going to be a change that would stick and change that would work they all believed that it was not of movement to go back to the to the Good old days. I don't. You may hear your parents or your or your grandparents talk about. I remember the days when when life was easy, when life was not so busy, when it wasn't so fast paced. The progressives didn't think that way. Let's not go. We're not trying to go back to the days of of when it was great and when it was wonderful. We're we're trying to do. We're making something better here. We're making. Uh, this is what we are doing is going to be the area the time to look back on and say I wish it was like that um, again they focused on the problems of the capitalist industrialist and that's the men who have created these problems social engineering was used uh, social engineering is seen in a couple of movies maybe you'll 
recognize them down at the bottom. Catch me if you can. It's the the movie that Leonardo DiCaprio plays. I believe that's the right movie I'm referring to, um, in which he's just this big con artist, and he manipulates people into doing what he needs them to do for his own benefit. And science becomes huge. We move, not we don't move away from religion, but we move from using religion that God is using the science that God has given us to make our life better and more efficient. Again, government moves out of the laissez-faire um, attitude and begins to regulate. Social Darwinism is not doing everything that the industrialists claim that it would do. In fact, it's making life worse for the laboring class. Um, there's a fear of monopolies, fear of concentrated wealth, and that is being attacked specifically through the Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, a lot of people, again, claim that progressivism and socialism go hand in hand and politically speaking economically speaking it probably does and so the attack on monopolies even though that's best for the consumer is still considered a move towards socialism uh, there needs to be a fine line there I believe to, uh, to fix those problems and again trying to make voters feel like they actually have a voice in the government whether they are from the industrial north and east of the country or whether they work as a farmer out in Iowa they all should feel like they have a voice uh, in government and break up that political machine power one major movement is the moral uh, reform movement and in this movement we see the social gospel and it as 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 the name part uh, correctly uh, gives away you know we're looking at the the church involvement although the church involvement was uh, minimal. Religion was minimal in this. They just simply used the idea that it's you just need to be a good person. You don't have to be a religious person to make a change. You just have to be a good person. Although a lot of the work does find its home through Protestant churches as well as Catholic. Um, most of the work is coming through the Protestant church. They take the idea from England of the Salvation Army. That's one of the biggest movements. Uh, the idea of helping those people, and it's still around today. Uh, Springfield has a large uh, uh, organization of Salvation Army, and you, you guys probably seen all the kettle, the red kettles, during Christmas time uh, as a way to raise money for that. So it's still uh, in effect today. Uh, again, religion not a dominant element, uh, but it's definitely a, a moral, a powerful moral component, and that still rings true today. If you find yourself in need of assistance of the Salvation Army. They do have certain requirements uh, of attending church. If you have, if you actually have to stay in one of their facilities, you do have to attend church services. Another uh, aspect of the moral social gospel movement is the Settlement House movement led by Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr. Hall House uh, is probably the most famous settlement house. And in these settlement houses, uh, we see uh, immigrants and their families uh, getting assistance uh, in this new life, in this new world that they've come to. Um, like the Salvation Army, it's not just a handout for free. You hang out and get fed and get clothes and, and a nice warm place to stay. stay. In the settlement house, you stayed there under the requirements of attending class, uh, classes such as uh, learning a trade, learning a skill, classes on learning how to speak English, getting the basics of you know, education, you know, math and reading and everything, and, you know, just the basics down so that when you were finally ready to leave the settlement house, you could actually make it on your own. And a lot of people who left the settlement house successfully, they actually actually came back and, and contributed assistance on their own. We do see a lot of men uh, getting involved in the settlement house movement as well. College women play a huge role in uh, the entire progressive movement but specifically in the social gospel movement um, women are being sent off young women being sent off to England to get an education and they are getting involved in women's movements in England and the reform movements that are taking place in England and they learn uh, the uh, the English ways and they bring those back and apply those to the reform movements uh, here in uh, in the states 
another aspect of politi- of the uh, progressive movement is the political reform and the number one uh, action of this political reform is is earning suffrage the right to vote for women it's the largest movement of the era it's if anybody talks about progressive movement that's probably one of the first things they talk think of is the women's rights and, and the suffrage movement um, suffragists fight against this sphere of domesticity, the idea that the woman's place is in the home, raising the kids, taking care of the family. Um, women take that and run with it, and actually they kind of spin it around and say, look, you've given us this this sphere to uh, be in control of. Well, we tell you that our experience and our skill at running this sphere at controlling the sphere of our lives or of society's lives uh, makes us even more worthy of the vote um, anti-suffragists link the suffragists and women in favor of getting the vote to promiscuity and the neglect of children they claim that they're too radical that they're leaving behind their rightful places and then as a result the families are suffering um, a lot of that is due to the fact of the type of woman who worked with the suffrage movement. Very rarely was it a, a, a married woman with children. I mean, it is. There are there are cases w- when that was the situation, but most of the women involved in the suffrage movement are uh, single and young and college educated. And like I said earlier, they're they're coming back from England and have lived in a new radical world in Europe. And when they come back home, it's you know, it's not the return to uh, Mayville or to the, you know, t- quiet little town. And so, yeah, they're going to be linked with this new radical behavior. Of course they are. For a woman to smoke in public, for a woman to talk to two or three different guys in, in the same night, just sit and talk with them, was looked upon. And that's what we're, that's what we're referring to there as being promiscuous. Kissing a man in public. How dare you do such a thing? One major... Uh, Suffrage movement or suffrage association is NASA, National American Women's Suffrage Association. Probably the most famous leader of this was Carrie Chapman Catt. Um, she wanted to lobby states, go do a state by state campaign, and for the most part, it was successful in the West. We see uh, states like Wyoming uh, giving women the right to vote in local and state elections early, early on. But she did not want to ruffle the feathers, so to speak, of D.C. Um, too much and it's not until the National Women's Party and people like Alice Paul and Lucy Burns radicals uh, educated in England coming back to the states do we see a a, a D.C. committee lobbyist committee focused specifically on lobbying congressmen and that's all they did was bug the, bug the congressmen uh, they have major parades uh, women are arrested uh, especially during World War One or times leading up to World War One, when they were striking out in front of the White House, uh, that was considered to be a violation of the Sedition Act and the Espionage Acts, and they're taken to prison and they're fined ten dollars. And when they don't pay their fine, they have to spend sixty days in a work prison. And one of the more famous stories is when Alice Paul goes on a uh, hunger strike. Um, all of this is in a movie, uh, which I will refer to. I'll show you in a little bit, but. Um, major major radical efforts and in fact the national women's party is forced to split off from uh the, the national american women's suffrage association because they were seen as too radical even you know, women themselves almost were their own worst enemies uh the two two parties that could have worked together and maybe achieved suffrage much much quicker uh separated because of uh, differences in ideology and how things should be carried out. The 19th Amendment does uh, eventually get ratified shortly after World War One. Finally, Woodrow Wilson uh, supports that. <clears throat> the Food and Drug Administration uh, plays a key role in refining and, and regulating the meatpacking industry throughout the Spanish-American War. More men died from uh, spoiled meat or what they called tainted meat than in actual battle. I think we had 400 men or so killed in action by, you know, weapons of the enemy. We had about 4,000 men killed from our food we were sending at home. Foods processed, being put into cans and shipped to the uh, to the men, and they weren't safe because there was no cleanliness. 
uh, involved uh, in the packing. There was no regulation of the packing. Um, all of this comes to light due to muckrakers, muckrakers such as Upton Sinclair. Uh, he actually, to to uh, to write his book, The Jungle, he gets a job in Chicago in the meatpacking industry, and he learns all the ins and outs, and he gets to know the immigrants working there, and he gets to see firsthand uh, what's going on. His goal of the book was to show how badly the workers were being treated, but by the time his story is published and read, it comes to be a story on how badly the meat is being treated. And he says a famous quote, I aimed at the heart but hit it in the stomach. Um, and because of this book, Teddy Roosevelt actually encourages and creates, has the FDA created and goes on a uh, major uh, plan to uh, renovate and regulate the meatpacking industry. Um, in 1906, we see uh, labels being required stamps of approval by the government consumers start to feel safe and they start to rely on the government if you see the government stamped and the government's checked it that it must be good and that's one of the official checkers stamping the the hogs the pork there social social jurisprudence uh how do you determine what's fair in our court systems up until this time we used precedent we used, you know, what what's the precedent? What has happened before? How have the rulings gone down before? And let's follow that precedent. Let's follow that example. Uh, progressives, though, they take they take a look at the law, and they say the law should be determined by looking at its effect on people. In one case, Mueller versus Oregon. Essentially, the state passes uh, work hours, laws reg regulating hours uh, for women. And because the women have to be home, the women working too long it impacts the family. So women can only work 10 hours a day. Mueller owns a steam shop laundry, says it's unconstitutional. You're telling me I can only work my shop 10 hours a day, or I can you know, I'm limited to what I can do. You can't tell me how to run my own business. Uh, and according to precedent, that would be accurate. However, based on uh, the National Consumer League's findings. And their argument that, again, the life, the work, working of the woman and impacts families, impacts the mor morals of the family, and by extension the community, the law has changed. And uh, the court upholds the 10-hour workday that Oregon, the state of Oregon, passed. Again, the validity of the law determines, and it's based on what how it affects society. In regards to... Another moral movement, or actually this is part of, actually this is the social uh, aspect of progressivism. Temperance movement is the uh, number one focus on changing behaviors in society. They focus on alcohol, how bad alcohol is. Alcohol steals money from families. Alcohol uh, in ca causes an increase in domestic violence. Alcohol hurts women because the domestic violence is usually carried out against women. And even some industry types, the owners claim that alcohol hurts industry because if men come into work drunk or hungover, uh, you know, they're slower on the job or there's accidents on the job. Big organization formed here is the WCTU, Women's Christian Temperance Union. Carrie Chapman, uh, no, this is uh, not Carrie Chapman, Cat. I can't think of her name. She carried her uh, a hatchet around. She'd walk into saloons. This little old lady, little old grandma would walk into saloons politely ask the bar owner to close the saloon down. Send these men home to their families where they belong. Bar owner's like, you're crazy. Get out of here, woman. And that's all it took. She'd start busting up the place with her little hatchet. She was arrested many times, but the men left and went home. Um, anyhow, it's a big push to get alcohol out of society, and they, they are successful with the 18th Amendment being ratified in 1919 and uh, eliminating the sale and manufacture of alcohol. Unfortunately, the downside to that amendment is we see a rise in organized crime, uh, a rise in the speakeasies, and, and uh, people like Al Capone get, get his rise to power because of the 18th Amendment. A lot of downsides to the 18th Amendment. Uh, yes, it was intended to do good things, but uh, as we have mentioned in earlier lessons, you know, who's... Who should govern that? Is that a federal government's uh, role in society, or is that you know that blue law of alcohol? Is that is that a state and local situation? Well, the federal government took it upon themselves 
and you can see what happened there. Another downfall, another negative side of the tempers movement is the, uh, the fact that the saloons with the 18th Amendment, the saloons are shut down. Well, for the immigrant family, the saloon was not just a bar. The saloon was a restaurant that they might frequent. The saloon was the bank uh, to cash the weekly paycheck because not all, not all immigrants went to the established bank to cash checks. They didn't trust that type of system. They just went to someone they knew, someone they trusted. They cast their check, maybe had a drink or two, and then went home. So when the saloon shuts down, they make a major impact on the lives uh, of immigrants. Now, most of the Progressive Era takes place under the reign of Teddy Roosevelt. But in 1912, he has a new challenger. Actually, it's not a new challenger. The, the, new, the Democrats throw up their man, Woodrow Wilson. I say not a challenger to Roosevelt because Roosevelt took over in 1904 uh, when McKinley was shot. He was vice president, and then you know Roosevelt takes over because McKinley died, and then Roosevelt runs for re-election, and wins that re-election because of his abilities when he took over for McKinley, and because of some of the fame fame he earned in the Spanish American War. But Roosevelt made a statement when he got elected for the first time, not not the McKin not finishing up McKinley's term, but when Roosevelt actually got elected, earned the earned election, won the election. He made it very clear that he was only running this one term. He didn't want to be a, a lifetime politician. And at that moment, he ended any possible uh, bribery, so to speak. He ended any possible chance that big interests and big companies and big money would have over him as far as election campaign financing. If he's not wanting re-election, then what good is their money to him? And so he sets himself up to really be a very strong president in regards to taking on big business. And his idea is to regulate biz big business. He becomes known as the trust-busting president. Uh, I think during his tenure of four years, he has 44 cases before the Supreme Court um, breaking up trusts. Uh difference between Wilson and Roosevelt. Will, Roosevelt believes some trusts are good, some trusts are bad. Um, get rid of the bad ones, keep the good ones. Uh, he put some teeth behind the Sherman Antitrust Act. You saw that as negative. He put some teeth behind the Interstate Commerce Act. Let's take care of the farmers. Let's take care of the little guy. Uh, government, Roosevelt believes, should be a steward of public welfare, uh, but not welfare like we know it today. Roosevelt, it would have nothing to do with people wanting to sit around all day and just receive government monies. Uh, that's not his idea of uh, public welfare. Let's make the rules fair for everyone so that everyone has a chance at a square deal. And by square deal, meaning you have your right to make money and, and to live comfortably. But you have to go out and earn that square deal. You, you can't just sit back and let it be handed to you. There's no one going to be buying you phones. No one's going to be paying your house payment. No one's going to be paying your child support. You actually have to go out and earn your money to take care of your family, take care of yourself. And so that's where I think Roosevelt does get a negative image as being part of the progressive movement in those regards. But... Uh, yeah, he would not agree with the uh, the welfare state as we as we have it today. Wilson, on the other hand, believed all uh, trusts were bad and and took the trust busting a step further. And um, even though Wilson was a Democrat, he was more like Roosevelt than uh, Taft. Now, when Roosevelt was finished with his first fully elected term, he essentially handpicks uh, Howard Taft to succeed him. Uh, the story goes that Will Roosevelt has Taft and Mrs. Taft over for dinner, and during the course of the evening, Roosevelt asks Mr. Taft, uh, Howard, uh, William, what do, you, what do you want? Do you want the, the presidency, or do you want the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? And, and almost simultaneously, 
William Howard Taft says the Supreme Court, and Mrs. Taft says the presidency, and the rest is history. So, gentlemen, take a lesson there. Uh, listen to your wives. Um, Mrs. Taft gets her way, and William Howard Taft becomes president. Now he, you know, he has to go through the process. But when you got the nomination and the support of T.R., uh, the public's going to listen. Taft uh, never feels comfortable in the White House. Uh, he claims in his memoirs that any time someone would say, good morning, Mr. President, he would turn to look to see if Teddy Roosevelt wasn't standing behind him. He just never got comfortable. He put people in positions of power uh, who then began to manipulate him. Um, a lot of Roosevelt's land conservation efforts were destroyed. Uh, Roosevelt had like a million acres of land set aside uh, for conservation, uh, and just and then in just one signing of Taft's signature, that million acres goes to a lumber company, um, and so little things or big things, as, as it would be uh, like that, cause Roosevelt to come essentially out of retirement, well, back from Africa from hunting wild game and big game, uh, to run uh, for president again, something that he swore he would not do, but he felt like it was his duty to right the wrongs of the Taft administration. So Taft come, or Roosevelt comes back and runs as a Republican, but he runs as a bull moose progressive Republican. Essentially, it splits the ticket, splits the Republican Party. Again, Wilson running for the Democrats. He's just as progressive as Teddy Roosevelt, so he's got the full support of the Democrats. And with the split in the Republican Party, there's no way that either Roosevelt or Taft will win. So 1912 goes to the Democrats. I think it's the first time in 14 years or so that they hold office. Uh, and with uh, the end of World War One, or I should say the beginning of World War One, we see the end of the Progressive Era. It didn't end on a bad note. Um, the, all reform movements were successful, and so they feel like because of the success they had, it's okay to let it end. We, we, we did what we set out to do. So yay for us. We made, we made the change, and now history is going to remember that. History is going to look back on this time and say, I wish we could go back to those good old days. Here's the movie I was referring to earlier. Uh, it's called uh, Iron Jawed Angels. Very, very good movie. Um, it, it's very eye-opening, I must say. The very first time I watched it, I had as much studying as I had done on women's history. I've never uh, come across the information found in this. And it is, uh, it's, I don't want to, how do you call it? It's historical fiction, but it's all based on fact. It's a historical movie. It's everything in here is accurate. Um, you know, there's some old Hollywood moments where they show love interests with the main character and somebody else, you know, you just, you, they do that to sell movies. But as far as the historical aspect of the movie, I extremely, extremely good and eye opening. So guys, thanks for watching. Hopefully you've enjoyed this and learned a little bit. Again, watch as many times as you need to catch the notes and remember, Mr. President, what will you do for suffrage? <laughs>